hasn't noticed yet. Good morning, and Good morning. welcome to the Community Presbyterian Church of Pismo Beach. It's a blessing to have you all here today. And we also say good morning to uh, part of our church member that is watching, part of our church family that is watching on YouTube today. And uh, we give thanks that uh, we have the chance when the world is in such chaos to come together and to come together in support and in peace. Uh, you know, you all, like me, have seen this uh, breakout of a war in Europe. And uh, when war breaks out, maybe it's because I'm a dad, but one of the first things I think about are the parents. And so today I'm thinking about grieving parents. I'm thinking about those Ukrainian parents whose son or daughter died defending their nation this past week, defending their democracy. But I also think about the Russian parents, and I think of many of them who I've read are angry that their son or daughter, in their view, has died in vain. And so we think of all, all of the death of any human being is such an incredible loss. And so we think of the loss of Ukrainian and Russian lives today. Well, I just have a, a moment of silence for all who've died, but also for their moms and their dads and their grandparents. Many of them, the older folks who left Ukraine, the younger people who stayed behind to defend the country they love. Let us have a moment of silence. Thank you. Today, uh, you'll notice in the church, the, the vestments are white today. And that's because in the Christian church, Roman Catholic and Protestant, today is Transfiguration Sunday. And I'll be speaking a moment in my sermon about the meaning of transfiguration. But it's a time where the divinity of Christ was powerfully revealed to several of Jesus' disciples, leaders in the early church. And you'll understand when you hear the sermon why white is the color for the vestments today. You know, today is also a day of wonderful good news to share with you. A wedding is always fantastic news. And I wanted to announce this morning that next Sunday, Kelly Springford and David Kim will be married down in Southern California. And they're two Mothers of the Bride, Kathy and Nancy are here this morning. I just want to say congratulations. This is your first child to be married of your two daughters. And it's just fantastic news. And when you see them next week, will you please tell them that our church family sends them love and congratulations as well. Thank you. And we're thankful for both of them having worked as police officers and put their lives on the line. Uh, for you know the people and uh, so we give thanks for them and hope they have a fantastic fantastic wedding at the end of the service today and i think what i'd like to do for the next many sundays is close our service with the song let there be peace on earth it's a wonderful suggestion by our organist kathy wilding and so you have an insert in your bulletin today with the words and there's a lot of different words to that song. I really like the inclusive nature of these particular words. And so for the next month or two, we'll be closing our serving service singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth, as we worship every week the Prince of Peace, Jesus of Nazareth. Oh. Yeah. oh, and then at the end of the service today, uh, after you sing, if you could just tuck that in your hymn book, uh, that would be great. We appreciate that. Also, I wanted to let you know the fantastic daily devotionals uh, are here. Uh, these have daily readings for April, May, and June. Uh, they're really, really well written. There's a bunch of them at the Fellowship Hall, and so you can grab one today. 
uh, and they're our gift to you. Uh, also, wanted to let you know that we will be gathering, those of you who'd like to stay after church for a few minutes, we will be gathering in a fellowship hall uh, to be able to, to talk together and to be together. So you're invited for that. And now let us, all who are able, please stand for the call to worship. Jesus stands, Jesus on the mountain peak. Let us, if we dare to speak. This is God's beloved Son. First and last and only one. All creation shall adore him. Let us worship God. For him this morning, number 155, rejoice. The Lord is King. for a silent confession. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah.
takes me a minute with everybody wearing a mask to I start recognizing people going, oh my gosh, there's, there's Randy and the kids. And there's, it's so great to see you guys. Welcome. Our first lesson this morning is from Exodus chapter 34. Verses 29 to 35, both of these passages are from the lectionary this morning, which means Christians all over the world are hearing the same passages. And thank you, Kathy, for your magic touch to get the organ going. I, it, it did it itself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> was too loud. You just never know. That's what's so yeah. great about the church. You never know what's going to happen. And now it's all recorded, so it's there forever, you know. <laughs> My brother's watching. Pete, stop laughing right now. Okay. All right. Our scripture passage. Both of our passages have a transfiguration theme uh, as the, the faces of both leaders involved are transformed. Let us listen together for the word of God. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. And when Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. And afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he gave them in commandment all the Lord has spoken with him at Mount Sinai. And when Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with them, he took the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, people of Israel saw the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone. And Moses would put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him, referring to the Lord. Here is our first lesson. Thanks be to God. The second lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, reading at chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. Let us listen together for the word of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him, meaning Jesus, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as Jesus was praying, the appearance of his countenance was altered and his raiment became dazzling white. And behold, the two men talked with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but kept awake. And they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is well that we are here. Let us make three booths, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he said this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silence and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Here is our second lesson. Thanks be to God. Can you recall a moment in your life when suddenly you saw or heard something 
which made you feel as if you were standing on holy ground, a moment of grace when you felt overwhelmed by a powerful sense of the divine, of God's loving presence. Often that moment of grace is evoked in our hearts by music. Two weeks after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr., my family went to a rally in downtown Portland, Oregon in memory of Dr. King. A choir from a local Baptist church at the end of the rally began to sing, We Shall Overcome. And near the end of the song, the entire crowd of around 2,000 people had joined in singing with the choir, and the last verse we sang together was this one, Black and White Together. Black and White Together, Someday. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. My dad later told me in that crowd was black and white, Republican and Democrat, liberal and conservative. It was a group of Americans coming together to thank God for the life of a pastor who gave us all to the very end, who believed that we shall overcome. Now, while I was only a child, just a month short of my ninth birthday, I felt that I was on holy ground that day. And on this last Sunday during Black History Month, let us give thanks for that great anthem of the Civil Rights Movement, a song we need to hear more than ever today, as we pray that God will help us stay strong and faithful until we overcome not only the racism in our nation, but the heartbreak and tragedy of world war. Of Holy Ground experience, as Thomas Forrester Smith once wrote, every now and then, when all seems most mundane or most stuck or most hopeless in our lives, suddenly we encounter a glimpse of another reality, a marvelous, glorious, inexplicable phenomenon which leaves us standing in awe, realizing there's a lot more to the picture than what we were in touch with or what we expected. Friends, beside music, a hike in the natural world created by God can take us to holy ground. Frederick Buechner, in his book, Whistling in the Dark, once described just such a moment in his life when, while walking among a grove of redwood trees, human reality seemed to merge with the divine. I spent four years of my life living up in Humboldt County in redwood country, and so Beekner's words in the following illustration really resonate with me. I'm sure many of you can relate as well if you've ever stood in the shadow of those giants. Beekner writes, I remember seeing a forest of giant redwoods for the first time. There were some small children nearby, giggling, chattering, pushing, a, pushing each other around as kids naturally do. Nobody had to tell them to quiet down as we entered the grove. They quieted down all by themselves. Everybody did. You couldn't hear a sound of any kind. It was like coming into a vast, empty room. There, there was a stillness and a stateliness about the redwoods that seemed to become part of you as you stood there stunned by the sight of them. They had been growing in that place for going on 2,000 years. With infinite care, they were growing even now. You could feel it. Friends, speaking of the intersection of the human and the divine, as experienced by Beekner, our scripture lesson this morning from Luke also reminded me of my childhood. I remember summer days as a child lying on my back in a huge field behind our home in Lake Oswego, Oregon, looking up at large, white, billowy clouds. We're going to hear more about clouds in a few minutes. I remember feeling moved by the clouds' beauty, fascinated by the diversity of the shapes they formed as they contrasted with glorious blue sky. Most of us have a memory of doing that on a summer day. Just laying on our backs, looking up at the sky, watching the clouds roll by, not a care in the world. 
When will the children of Ukraine again be able to do such a simple yet profound thing as look up at the clouds and dream? Now, I think it was most likely because I was a preacher's kid that I looked up to those clouds that day wondering how far heaven was from the glorious sight that I saw above me. I wondered if God was looking down at me and truly cared for me and all people, as my dad faithfully preached in his weekly Sunday sermons. I remember looking up at the clouds framed by the smog-less blue Oregon sky and feeling admiration for what seemed like a work of art which surely had been painted by God. A favorite song of mine by Joni Mitchell speaks of the art found in clouds and of their use as a metaphor for the human struggle for meaning and hope in life. She used them as a metaphor as they're a metaphor in our New Testament lesson today. Describing clouds, she sings rows and flows of angel hair and ice cream castles in the air. Feather canyons everywhere. I looked at clouds that way. But now they only block the sun. They rain and snow on everyone. So many things I would have done, but clouds got in the way. I've looked at clouds from both sides now, from up and down, and still somehow it's cloud illusions, I recall. I really don't know clouds at all. My friends, it was no coincidence that when the voice of God spoke to Peter, James, and John up on that mountain, spoke to them about Jesus, God's voice came out of a cloud. Those who originally heard Luke's gospel were, of course, Jews. And in their religion, the cloud symbolizes the very presence of God. Luke knew that the Jews remembered the Old Testament stories of how God came over them like a cloud in the wilderness. They remember the story of Moses' face shining, oh yes, after he was in the very presence of God on cloudy Mount Sinai. They knew very well that, that when their ancestors were in the wilderness for 40 years, God came like a pillar of fire by night and a cloud during the day. Yes, the cloud symbolized the power and presence of God coming upon the Jews wandering in the desert. And now, out of that same divine cloud of their tradition, the voice and wisdom of God was present again, as Jesus, Moses, Elijah, Peter, James, and John stood together on the holy ground of the Mount of Transfiguration, the Mount of Transformation and Change. Yes, from out of that mysterious mass of cloud, which enveloped them all, the voice of God, speaking of Jesus, said to Peter, James, and John, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. Luke couldn't have been more clear. Honor Moses, respect Elijah, but listen to Jesus. Sometimes I feel like one of the reasons this country has been so messed up is not a lot of, not enough people are listening to Jesus. Frederick Beekner, who I love, commenting on this very passage, writes, it's as strange a scene as there is in the Gospels. Yet even without the voice from the cloud to explain it, Peter, James, and John had no doubt what they were witnessing as they beheld the shining face and the dazzling white cloak of the person standing before them. They were sleepy. But they knew who it was. It was Jesus of Nazareth standing before them, all right. The man they'd hiked down many a dusty mile with, whose mother and brothers they knew. The one they'd seen as hungry, tired, and footsore as the rest of them. Looking at Jesus that day, they were seeing also the Messiah, the Christ, in his glory. It was the holiness of, of the man shining through his humanness. Jesus' face, like Moses' face centuries before, his clothing so afire with God's spirit, they were almost blinded. Friends, Peter, James, and John up on that mountain 
in great fear as they are fully enveloped by the cloud, find themselves suddenly on holy ground. And I think it really hit them in a new way that day, deep in their hearts, that Jesus was not only their esteemed rabbi and trusted friend, he was the source of the new hope and joy that had gripped their lives. Yes, the young rabbi Jesus was not just a prophet or a messenger of God. He was literally God's son. As my seminary professor Herman Wagen used to say, Jesus was a chip off the old divine block. Luke says he was one to whom they should listen. The meaning of the transfiguration story in Luke is that Jesus was not only wise, kind, and loving as he had been to them when they went up that mountain, now in their eyes he was holy, he was divine. Now there was no doubt in their minds, Jesus descending the mountain beside them was the very presence of God in their lives, indeed, in the world. And I believe Jesus was not the only one transformed by this experience on the mountain. So had that process, that experience, begun to transform Peter, James, and John. Well, that's where we come in. For no one can enter the presence of God without ultimately being transformed themselves. Doesn't matter where it happens, when you enter the presence of God, you are transformed. For God is love, and love transforms everything it comes into contact with. When we truly open ourselves to that divine voice that spoke from the cloud, and really listen to Jesus today, then we too will be transformed. If we listen to Jesus' words and embrace his deeds, then ultimately we will be able to forgive as he forgave. We will be able to love as he loved. The voice of God says from the cloud, listen to him. Honor Elijah, respect Moses, but listen to Jesus. He is your, is, is your focus. Listen to Jesus. And we would be wise to do so today. For many voices in the world today can lead us astray, can lead us away from the presence of God. There are too many people in the world today who are blinded by lies and steeped in ignorance because they praise Jesus loudly, but they don't really listen to him. Our ultimate loyalty must be to God alone, who speaks to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we are to loyal to Jesus, then this world full of heartbreak and oppression, of violence and war, will have a chance to become a kingdom of justice and righteousness and peace. Too many Americans have given away their royalty their ultimate loyalty to another person, another leader, a loyalty that belongs only to God. We listen to Jesus. We will know who to trust, who's telling the truth. We will know who to follow. And I close with the true story of a woman of faith named Renova who did just that, having worshiped God faithfully, having been loyal to Christ, she ultimately was transformed so that her life reflected the life of Christ. And that's the point, isn't it? For coming to church, for singing, for praying, for praising God is to become Christ-like in our own lives. Jesus once said to his disciples, greater things will you do for I go to the Father. We are the body of Christ in the world. The world is in need of that Christ. 
Jesus had been speaking to her for years. Renola finally listened. Let me tell you a little bit about Renola. Anne Lamott writes, she is a backbone of the church she attends. She sings in the choir, teaches Sunday school, and is there every time the doors are opened. Renola never misses church. Everybody loves Renola. Renola loves everybody. Well, almost everybody. Ken also attends church. Ken has AIDS. Ken is gay. Renola, raised by conservative Baptists in the South, never knew what to do with Ken. So she usually just ignored him. Ken attended Renola's church in Marin City, California, Presbyterian Church, faithfully for a year. But then he got very sick with AIDS and had to miss many weeks. On the Sunday Ken came back to worship, Renola continued in her standoffishness. This is a woman who deeply loves God. She's not choosing this place to be in life. This is what she was raised with. She had listened to people who had told her to turn her back on LGBT people. She had listened to them. But then, a moment of grace. Holy ground appeared one Sunday during worship. The choir began to sing the hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow. As the congregation sang, in a small church just like this one, Renola looked down from her place in the choir loft, and she saw Ken down in the front pew, his body devastated by AIDS. AIDS has no mercy. Ken was sitting in the pew, he was sitting in the pew, while others stood to sing, because he didn't have the strength to stand up. But still, to Renola's amazement, Ken sang with great joy. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. So I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And as the congregation sang, Renola left. She left that choir loft, and she went down to that pew where Ken was sitting. And she reached down, and she gently, gently lifted Ken up. She held him as they sang together. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And Lamont concludes, Now I doubt that when she got up that morning, Renola imagined that by noontime she would be holding a gay man with AIDS as they sang together. But somehow from her perch in the choir loft, her mount of transfiguration, if you will, Renola looked out at the world and she saw it from a completely different perspective. She looked down at Ken and she heard somewhere deep inside her the voice of the Lord saying of Ken, this is my child, my beloved. And you know what Renola did? She listened. Friends, Renola listened, and she took those words to heart, and standing there on holy ground, her life was forever changed. May we here in Pismo Beach and on the Central Coast find within us the courage and the grace to listen to God. For God in Christ is speaking to us, even and often in the most ordinary events and moments of our lives. And so as Beekner says, listen, 
Listen to what happens to you. Because it is through what happens to you that God speaks. It's a language not always easy to decipher, but it's there powerfully, memorably, and unforgettably in, with, and under the events of our lives, your life, and my life. God speaks to us. He really does. Speaks to us within the shadow of a redwood tree. Speaks to us in a vision of art. In the life of a sick family member, friend, or a stranger. In the death of one who we, can ima who we cannot imagine life without. God speaks to us in the smiles or tears of a child. In the courageous actions of those defending their homeland. And those protesting war. God speaks in the voices of a small church choir which sings, His eye is on the sparrow, and we shall overcome. In all these circumstances and countless more, we most certainly are being addressed by God. You and I believe in God probably in different ways. One thing we can know for certain is that God is love. By whatever name we use to address God, God is love. So listen. Listen to Jesus. For God is speaking to your heart, even now. Now let us continue our service by singing together our God, our help in ages past. You may remain seated.
joining together in prayer, let us pray. Holy God, hear our prayers for all those who will die today because of war in Ukraine and other war-torn countries all over this earth. Grant them an end to the suffering of this world and eternal peace that is only found in you. O oh God, we pray for the people of Ukraine, Russia, and all nations, that war and bloodshed can be avoided and a new just peace can be forged out of this crisis. We pray for and call on our leaders to have the courage to take small, verifiable, and independent steps toward peace, inviting others to reciprocate. We thank you for the leadership of President Biden and other NATO leaders united to defend democracy in Ukraine. We pray that Putin will put an end to this illegal war, and we give thanks for the courage of President Zelensky as he leads his people. God, be with those suffering in ways that we cannot. Shield and comfort them as they confront the terror of violence that surrounds them. Hold them close to your heart and stay the hand of enemies against them. Give us the courage and the strength to cry aloud against wickedness in high places that dare to harm others made in your image. Comfort the children of Ukraine and Russia and heed their cries to be saved from harm in this world. Oh God, make us a people who love our children, all of our children, more than we love greed, power, and control. Forgive our fellow Americans who support the violence instigated by Putin. Overturn governments of tyranny wherever they are found. Disrupt the intentions of evil and give us power to stand against forces of greed and control here in the USA and all over the world. Dear God, we are especially mindful today of the over 1,000 Russian anti-war protesters in over 40 cities who risked their freedom and their very lives in standing up for Ukraine and against war. Dear God, we pray also today for our church members here in Pismo and on the Central Coast and all over California. We pray for those who have, have felt anxious or depressed by another war. Bring them comfort and peace and the sure trust that you are at work in this world that even when your children turn their backs on you and make war, you never stop loving and reaching out. We see you, O oh God, at work in leaders of many nations. Thank you, O oh God, that hearts are open to your wisdom and leadership among Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Pray for members of our church family, for Marlene Jung as she heals from a broken ankle. We pray for Ken Teisinger, suffering the pain of a twisted knee. We pray for Kathy Walding's sister, Carolyn, hospitalized with severe pain. Pray, O oh God, for Darlene Phillips' daughter's family Remy, Robin, Courtney, help them to find forgiveness, reconciliation, and new unity. We thank you, O oh God, for moments of healing grace. For no matter what we are suffering physically or spiritually, your love heals. As Renola picked up that man with AIDS, you pick us up, you stand with us. Help us to be 
the body of your son, Jesus Christ, in this world, bringing people comfort, love, peace, forgiveness, hope. Hear us now, O God, as we pray together, as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, we close our worship service this morning. We begin the last section of our service by standing and singing together, all those who are able to stand, God of grace and God of glory. Number 420.